Good afternoon. I'm Kate Pritchard, part of the NIH Office of Laboratory Animal Welfare. Today is Thursday, June 9th, 2022, and I'm pleased to welcome you and our speaker to our webinar today titled Animal Welfare in High Containment or Barrier Facilities Addressing Unique Challenges. There are just a few housekeeping details before we get started. If you have questions throughout the webinar, please enter them in the Q&A box. Dr. Tansy will be taking questions throughout the webinar. And if a question is a little bit more nuanced or context specific, we'll forward the question to her after the webinar and then we'll append the question and answer to the end of the transcript. We'll monitor the chat the best we can and we encourage you to use it to interact with us and other participants. All right, let's get started with an introduction for Dr. Tansy. Cassandra Marie Tansy, DVM, DACLAM, is Deputy Chief of the Comparative Medicine Branch in the Division of Scientific Resources at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Dr. Tansy received a, uh, received a BA in sociology from Rice University and her DVM from Texas A&M University before joining CDC to complete a postdoctoral residency in laboratory animal medicine. In her current position, Dr. Tansy oversees the daily operations of CDC's program of animal care, co-manages the comparative medicine branches laboratory animal residency program, and provides veterinary support for high containment research among other responsibilities. Her interest in public health and infectious disease has led to work in event-based surveillance for the International Task Force in the Zika response, field epidemiology during an outbreak of Seoul hantavirus in the U.S., and several roles during the COVID-19 response from household transmission study assessing SARS-CoV-2 infections in pets, residing in households with laboratory-confirmed human cases, to leading a team investigating a SARS-CoV-2 outbreak at a Wisconsin mink farm. Dr. Tansy is currently a member of a number of professional organizations, including the American Veterinary Medical Association, the American Association of Laboratory Animal Science, and the American College of Laboratory Animal Medicine. She can be reached at ctansy at cbc.gov, and we'll be sure to put that in the chat box. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Tansy. Thanks so much, Dr. Pritchard. Um, my name is Cassandra Tanzi. I am, as Dr. Pritchard mentioned, the Deputy Chief of the Comparative Medicine Branch here at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I was thrilled to receive the invitation to speak on this particular topic because animal welfare and high containment are two of my favorite topics to talk about. Um, this is going to be a bit of a whirlwind presentation today because I could probably talk about this topic for about four hours and I'm going to try to condense it down into 45 minutes. If you have questions, I absolutely encourage you to submit them and I will try to answer them as we go through the presentation. So my goals for today are to have each of you understand the unique animal welfare challenges that come with housing animals in high containment or barrier facilities, for you to be able to evaluate those challenges and implement methods to prevent or address them, and to give you a list of, of resources for future reference. Just a couple of quick questions before we begin, so I have an idea of the audience. And so this is going to be, we're going to be polling you. So please have your mice ready. First up, your role in your current workplace. All right. So we'll close that one and take a look at the results. So veterinarians and a lot of others. Okay, I'm, I'm interested in the others. Biosafety, all right, Aya Cook Admin, Biosafety, Training Program Manager, great. Project Manager, fantastic. Okay, so next up, does your workplace utilize animal models in high containment or barrier facilities? And it is okay if you don't know. This is a short question, so we'll go ahead and close it out. All right, most of you do, fantastic. Have you worked in a high containment or a barrier facility? And this is just gonna be a yes, no question because I'm assuming if you've worked in one of these, you're gonna know it. Let's see what we have. 
Okay. All right. About two thirds have worked in one of these facilities. Perfect. So what species are utilized in high containment or barrier facilities at your workplace? Some common ones, and then if there are some others, please list them in the chat. I'm really curious. Ooh, raccoons, deer. Rabbits, hamsters, guinea pigs. All right. Some, some more rabbits. All right. You can oh, turkeys. All right. So we can close out this one. Lots of rodents, some ferrets, swine, non-human primates. Okay. I've got some eggs. Very cool. Bats. Love it. Um, last question. Does your IACUC review protocols that take place in high containment or barrier facilities or inspect those spaces? This is again, guess no, I don't know. I think everybody is probably able to answer their questions pretty quickly at this point so we can see what the answers are. Yes, okay, fantastic. All right, well, I think, I think I will present some information that will be useful to all of you. It does look like we have a fairly diverse audience. So I am gonna spend the first couple minutes just talking about biosafety levels, how they relate to high containment and barrier facilities, uh, just to give everyone an idea of how they are different from conventional facilities before we move on to the unique challenges that they pose. Biosafety levels are used to identify the protective measures that are needed in a laboratory setting to protect workers, the environment, and the public. Biosafety in microbiological and biomedical laboratories, also known as the thimble, defines different levels of containment. BSL-1 labs are used to study agents that are not known to consistently cause disease in otherwise healthy adults. BSL-2 labs are used to study moderate risk infectious agents that pose a risk if accidentally inhaled, swallowed, or exposed to the skin. The equipment, practices, and laboratory design features that are needed to achieve appropriate biosafety and biocontainment are summarized in this table from the thimble. Biosafety levels three and four, which are, is what's shown, are what we consider high containment. BSL-3 labs are used to study agents or toxins that can be transmitted through the air and cause potentially lethal infection through inhalation exposure. And BSL-4 labs are used to study agents or toxins that pose a high risk of aerosol transmitted lab infections and life-threatening disease where we do not have a vaccine or therapy currently available. So for those who aren't familiar with working in a high containment lab, let me walk you through a typical day in a BSL-4 suit lab. You enter a locker room, you remove all your clothing, you put on dedicated facility scrubs or coveralls, and then you step into the suit room to perform a leak check on your suit, and then you put it on with your other PPE. So here you can see two CDC employees in this picture attaching an air hose to their suit, and that's going to maintain positive air pressure that keeps them safe. After you suit up, you step through another airtight door and you enter the laboratory space. Most of your work is gonna be conducted inside a biosafety cabinet, and every task that you do is gonna be made more difficult by your limited range of motion and the decreased tactile sensation that you'll have through two layers of fairly thick gloves. Once your work is complete, you begin the exit process. You step into a chemical shower seen here to scrub your suit down. After the shower, you hang your suit back up. You place your facility scrubs in a bag to be autoclaved and then laundered, and then you shower yourself out. Many ABSL3 spaces will have a similar process. 
but instead of using a suit, they're going to have a powered air purifying respirator and disposable coveralls, as you can see in this picture. High containment facilities are designed to prevent the accidental release of pathogenic organisms like Ebola or NEPA, while providing a safe and secure environment in which to study those organisms, potential treatments or vaccines for them. Facility design combined with strict safety protocols like airlocks, negative airflow and disinfecting showers help ensure maximum protection for the staff in the community. In contrast, barrier facilities are designed to protect the health of the animals living within them to prevent inadvertent exposures to microorganisms. So they're focused on bioexclusion and often utilize sterilized individually ventilated cages, sterilization or disinfection of all supplies and equipment prior to entry and use, sterilized feed and drinking water, air shower or wet shower entry of personnel. And then their personnel change into clean room processed scrubs and other PPE. All animal facilities have some version of a containment or barrier facility. Your quarantine suite. So these areas are focused on both biocontainment and bioexclusion, where we're trying to keep what's inside the quarantine suite away from the animals in the main vivarium and vice versa. Whether a high containment or a barrier facility, many of the challenges are going to be similar. So now that everyone is familiar with what high containment means and the, the similarities and differences with barrier facilities, let's talk about some of the challenges associated with performing animal research in these spaces. Each of these bullet points have differences from conventional animal housing that can potentially impact animal welfare. And we will go through each of these in the next couple slides. As you can probably imagine, based on my description, entering and exiting high containment and barrier facilities can be time and resource intensive. It takes me about 20 minutes to get into and out of an ABSL4 suite. And from a risk management perspective, you want to minimize the number of personnel entrances and exits because they are very time consuming. And the more people you have in the suites, the more opportunities you have for an accident or a potential exposure. That can influence how and how often health checks are performed on animals in those spaces. So at my institution, animals in high containment are only handled with at least two people present, which means that any health check you have that requires actually handling the animal must have two people scheduled. High containment and barrier facility layouts and space affect the way in which animal experiments are conducted as well. These labs are usually small and depending on the layout of the facility, animal housing and procedure space may be in the same room. Small housing spaces limit the number of animals that can be housed in the space, particularly non-rodent species. And depending on the nature of the study, animals may need to be singly housed due to transmission concerns. So that further restricts the animal housing numbers just based on the number of cages that you can fit in. So with space for animal housing at a premium in these facilities, really maximizing the informational output from a single animal is incredibly beneficial as you start to plan an animal experiment. Conducting animal experiments, especially in high containment facilities, involves several logistical challenges that can impact the collection of tissues and samples. Animal infections, monitoring, and tissue collection usually take longer in high containment, so fewer animals can be processed in a single day. The use of sharps is really discouraged in these areas due to the risk of pathogen exposure posed by an accidental cut or needle stick. And as I mentioned before, many institutions have policies that require that animals in these spaces are only handled under certain circumstances. So two people must be present and potentially the animal must be anesthetized due to human safety concerns. 
It's a completely understandable risk mitigation me measure, but anesthesia is not inherently benign. So each anesthetic episode does have an impact on animal health and welfare. Assessment of animal welfare depends on measurement of a number of parameters, which will vary according to the species, the animal's environment, and the study design, all of which are interrelated. So the authors of this article developed a matrix to assess the combined effects of environment and experimental events on welfare of macaques. Each of the four parameters, physical, psychological, environmental, and procedural, are scored between one and 10, where the score of one indicates the best possible state, and a score of 10 would be the worst possible state with the highest impact on welfare. You can see here that as animals change environments from breeding colonies to conventional housing to high containment housing, the score for the environmental parameter increased, indicating a worse welfare status. And that makes sense as we compare the environments that we are able to provide in breeding colonies versus the caging for high containment studies, which are generally smaller and designed to protect the health of the personnel working in the labs. On this slide, you can see the highly enriched outdoor corrals that breeding colonies are often maintained in with plenty of space, manipulanda and foraging opportunities, and the ability to form and maintain complex social structures. Contrast that with these cages, which were specifically designed to house marmosets in an ABSL3 lab. The cages are smaller, they're individually HEPA filtered and kept under negative air pressure with fewer opportunities for conspecific interaction. In some studies, animals may have to be singly housed due to the design of the study. So for example, in a study that is evaluating aerosol transmission between animals, you don't want animals interacting with each other and potentially spreading the disease through direct contact. This is an example of a play cage used at my institution for ferrets in conventional housing. So you can see there are multiple levels with a variety of environmental enrichment, such as hammocks for sleeping, manipulanda, and even a small pool at the bottom. And ferrets are housed in pairs or trios in this caging. And then you can compare that play cage with the ferret caging that is commonly utilized in high containment for influenza research. This graphic demonstrates differences in exposure to influenza virus between two established ferret transmission models. So naive ferrets are the white silhouette. They are either co-housed with inoculated ferrets on the top in the direct contact model, or they are placed adjacent to inoculated ferrets on the bottom in the respiratory droplet model. Areas of potential exposure to influenza are depicted in yellow, and then the arrows indicate dispersion of respiratory droplets that are being expelled from the inoculated ferret. As you can see, bulky enrichment items like a hammock could potentially impact the respiratory droplet transmission in experiments, so they cannot be used due to this particular study design. Having said that, once a transmission model is well characterized, you could then run a pilot study to evaluate the impact certain enrichment has on transmission dynamics. If no or a minimal impact is seen, you then have a really strong argument for updating the enrichment plan as a study refinement to increase animal welfare. The same can be done with pathogenesis studies which often prohibit the use of analgesics or anti-inflammatories since they can impact the immune response being evaluated in those studies. One of my colleagues, Victoria Moratz, 
actually performed a pilot study in collaboration with our influenza researchers here. And she evaluated whether buprenorphine affected influenza pathogenicity in ferrets. Her results published in, in Comparative Medicine in February show that the duration and location of viral replication the lymphohematopoietic changes and the clinical finds were comparable across all groups at all time points. So collectively, those findings support the continued evaluation of buprenorphine as, again, a refinement for animals in this study design. High containment and barrier facility animal use protocols tend to be more complicated than conventional animal use protocols. Many of the differences deal with the agent being tested, the species of the animal, the biocontainment facility, the complexity of the research being performed, the expertise and training of the research staff and veterinary personnel, and the PPE required to accomplish the approved protocol tasks. It can be exceptionally challenging to ensure that IACUCs have members with the expertise needed to provide thorough protocol reviews and recognize potential gaps in research proposals that take place in high containment and barrier facilities. IACUC members, especially the non-affiliated member, may not have the training or medical requirements necessary to enter and inspect high containment or barrier facilities. And in that case, how are these spaces and programs being effectively evaluated and inspected? Personnel working in high containment and barrier facilities also require more comprehensive training than those who work in conventional facilities. For example, facilities with dedicated staff overseeing the enrichment program and behavior management of the animals may not expect their care staff or research personnel to routinely perform behavior assessments. But behaviorists might not have the required medical, psychological, or security clearances to enter biocontainment rooms, and or they may not wish to enter those labs. So in those cases, care staff and research personnel may need training to perform the observations and assessments usually undertaken by behaviorists. All personnel who enter and interact with research animals in high containment or barrier facilities should be trained so that they are proficient performing animal welfare evaluations, perhaps utilizing a standardized scoring criteria, such as the Ferris Grimace scale seen here, and comfortable assessing whether humane endpoints have been reached. All right, so now that we have identified some of the challenges, we can talk about how we overcome them. Optimizing animal welfare requires a team approach. So the refinement of husbandry and procedures to reduce animal suffering and improve welfare is an essential component of humane science. Successful refinement depends on the ability to assess animal welfare effectively and detect signs of pain or distress as rapidly as possible so that suffering can be alleviated. The article this table is pulled from provides some practical guidance on setting up and operating effective animal welfare assessment. It describes the components of an ideal welfare state along with examples of the indicators associated with them. For example, an animal in an ideal psychological state displays species appropriate behavior. An indicator of an animal's psychological state would be a change in use of enrichment, the development of stereotypies, and or an increase in aggression towards conspecifics. This article does a really nice job setting out general principles for objective observation of animals, recognizing and assessing indicators of pain or distress, and then tailoring those to individual projects. They also review systems for recording indicators, including score sheets, 
and set out some guidance on how to determine practical monitoring regimes that are more likely to detect signs of suffering. So all of this guidance is intended for all staff required to assess or monitor animal welfare, including animal technicians, veterinarians, and scientists, because again, evaluating animal welfare is a team sport. The use of validated behavior assessments increases inter-observer reliability. So in mice strains that are robust nest builders, the time to integrate into nest test or tint is an objective observation of animal welfare. To conduct the test, you take a small amount of nesting material and you add it to the mouse cage and the nesting behaviors that occur immediately thereafter are observed. The test yields a positive result when a mouse integrates the new testing material into the main test site within 10 minutes. Failure to interact with the nesting material is defined as a negative result. Likewise, research has shown that changes in facial expression provide a reliable and rapid means of assessing pain in mice and rats. Grimace scales were first developed for these species based on changes in a number of facial action units, such as narrowing of the eyes or changes in the position and shape of the whiskers. Grimace scales have since been developed for other species, but a word of caution when using them, where Grimace scales are used to assess pain in real time at the cage side, each animal should be observed for a short period of time to avoid scoring brief changes in facial expression that are unrelated to the animal's welfare. And similarly, grimace scales should only be used in awake animals. The protocol review is perhaps the biggest opportunity we have to identify and overcome the animal welfare challenges that work in high containment and barrier facility pose. It's imperative that we as a research community ensure that these pro protocols are conducted with the utmost scrutiny for the welfare of the animals, as well as the health and safety concerns of the individuals conducting the studies. Both the welfare of the animals and the health and safety of the research staff must be balanced with the integrity of the science being performed. The specific areas of protocol review seen here come from a great ILAR article by Curtis Clagis called IACUC and Veterinary Considerations for Review of ABSL-3 and ABSL-4 Research Protocols. As you can see in the graphic, stakeholders like veterinary staff, researchers and any institutional health and safety officials represent each side of the triangle with each of them having a critical area of the protocol. Some stakeholders are experts in protecting personnel while others focus on the integrity of the science. And ideally all of your stakeholders are balancing the welfare of the animals on the study. Each study should be considered holistically to ensure that the project meets regulatory requirements. Questions for the IACUC to consider are, how and how often will clinical observations be performed? What, if any, supportive care will be provided? What are the scientific endpoints of this study? What are the euthanasia criteria? Are the criteria specific to this species and this agent? How and how often will animals be manipulated? What will be documented and where will those documents be kept? If documentation is not electronic, will veterinary staff or other personnel be able to access documentation when they need it? What training do personnel have? As I mentioned on the training challenges slide, Research personnel and animal care technicians may need training to perform the observations and assessments usually undertaken by veterinary or behavior staff. What contingency plans are in place to protect animal welfare in case of a disaster? 
Are there any specific security concerns that need to be addressed? How will items utilized in these studies be decontaminated before and or after use? And I'd like to spend a little extra time discussing a couple of these specific questions, although I really encourage you to read the article in full because it is great. First, clinical scoring. Clinical scoring guides identify critical indicators in a species and agent specific way. They often incorporate an animal's appearance, body condition score or weight, behavior, and their responsiveness to the observer. In order to develop or evaluate a clinical scoring guide, IACUCs and veterinary staff need to fully understand the animal model as much as currently known, as well as the infection and disease progression of the agent being studied. Understanding the agent and the animal model should be balanced with the overall goal of the study. This table from the article on defining and implementing protocols for welfare assessments in laboratory animal that I mentioned previously lists some of the questions that researchers and IACUCs can ask to develop clinical scoring systems. What indicator may be seen in this species with this agent? How frequently should animals be monitored and at what time to observe that indicator? How can that indicator be, be assessed in an, an objective way? Can environmental indicators be used? So to give an example, an indicator of a certain disease in mice is decreased activity. When should I observe the animal to evaluate whether activity is decreased? I would expect and mice to be sleeping during the day, so the best time to truly observe their activity level would be overnight. Can that activity be, be assessed in an objective way? Uh, perhaps through observing interactions with environmental enrichment. So like, yes, I can use the time to integration into nest tests or maybe quantitatively assess their use of a running wheel if it's present in the cage. So not all studies need an extensive scoring sheet. You know, some projects may use a single clinical sign to identify the endpoint for the animal. As an example, if it was found in a pathogenesis study that a 15% weight loss in an animal signifies that the animal will not survive, then that can become the initial criteria for euthanasia. And each animal having a 15% or greater weight loss will then immediately euthanized. Publishing the detection and reporting of clinical signs of a specific agent in a specific species potentially improves the welfare of all animals enrolled in similar studies by making it easier to develop robust clinical scoring guides, as well as humane endpoints. You can see here a list of common clinical signs of influenza virus infection in ferrets. And I want you to note that the author, Dr. Belzer, actually noted in these clinical signs several that are frequently used in criteria for humane euthanasia because of the development of severe disease with those signs. So those signs are weight loss, lethargy, and neurologic signs. And speaking of euthanasia criteria, the criteria should be tailored, again, to the specific agent and species, just like the clinical scoring guides. Knowledge of disease progression determines the frequency of observation, as you can see in this example, right? And this particular scale was developed for a paramyxovirus in hamsters. So there's an emphasis on neurological and respiratory signs. As the disease progresses in these animals, they begin having clinical signs and they get higher scores, which increases the number of health checks. 
if 24 hour monitoring is not available and an animal is scoring very high on a pain score, it is very worth considering whether or not to preemptively euthanize that animal. And that is of course um, up to the veterinarian's discretion. Although please do include your, your researchers in those conversations. As with clinical scoring guides, once euthanasia criteria are established and well validated, please publish them. <laughs> um, the ARRIVE guidelines recommend reporting animal care and monitoring information, including any interventions or steps taken in the experimental protocols to reduce pain, suffering, and distress, any expected or unexpected adverse events, as well as the humane endpoints established for the study, the signs that were monitored, and the frequency of monitoring. Adding this information to the body of literature builds a portfolio of opportunities for future possible interventions to better guard the welfare of the animals enrolled in these studies. There are several forms of minimally invasive monitoring that allow personnel to perform health checks and collect data without having to enter the space or handle the animals. Cameras can be set up in front of cages to allow remote visual assessments. Another option is telemetry, where small implanted devices permit automated and wireless measurements of parameters like temperature, blood pressure, and brain activity, with data then transmitted to a receiver outside the animal's cage. The ability to take automated physiological measurements wirelessly from these animals reduces the labor burden and increases staff safety, as well as reducing stress on the animals. As an added benefit, wireless and, automa and automated recordings permit much more extensive data collection over long periods of time and under more natural conditions because you're not having to handle the animals. And telemetry is not just an option for rodents. The authors of this article utilized telemetry for their study of Rift Valley fever in marmosets to measure temperature and activity every 15 minutes. In the telemetry data shown here, two marmosets were infected with Rift Valley fever. The animal on the left survived for the duration of the study, while the other met the criteria for euthanasia nine days after inoculation. You can see that both animals' temperatures show the characteristic diurnal variation prior to inoculation, with the onset of fever beginning three to four days after infection. Body temperature returned to near normal levels in the surviving marmoset, but remained increased in the animal with severe illness. Both of the marmosets displayed a decrease in activity that coincided with the onset of fever. There are also a number of products available that provide home cage monitoring systems for animals housed in individually ventilated cages, IVC. This technology makes it possible to check for the presence of food and a water bottle, to evaluate the condition of the bedding in the cage by analyzing the moisture content, and to monitor spontaneous animal movement within the cage remotely. This translates into avoiding unnecessary animal handling, supporting daily animal health checks, and preventing animal losses due to cage flooding. And that kind of seems too good to be true, right? <laughs> um, there are challenges to implementing those minimally invasive monitoring systems. So how can programs get institutional buy-in? Who pays for the equipment? and is responsible for ongoing maintenance. Where are the remote monitoring stations set up and who should have access to them? These are all important questions to answer as you consider these product, products. If your institution utilizes remote monitoring, I would love for you to let us know in the chat what arguments were most persuasive in getting institutional buy-in and the resources allocated for the project. 
I personally have found that combining occupational health and safety, so there are fewer people in the suite, which is safer, with animal welfare, and we're better able to evaluate and assess the health and well-being of the research animals to be an effective argument in favor of the resource allocation for these systems. And you can also recruit the researchers to your side by educating them on the additional data that they will be able to collect from each animal on these studies. We also need to take several considerations into account while we are deciding which animals we are going to enroll into studies in high containment or barrier facilities. So a full medical history review should be conducted prior to selecting animals. And when you are selecting a cohort for a study, it's also important to review records of past behavioral issues and assessments in order to exclude any animals with self-destructive or aggressive behaviors. So the space constrictions we previously discussed limit the ability to move problem animals to different room or cage locations. And it's also much more difficult and potentially dangerous to care for wounds in these spaces. Gender compatibility and group interactions should also be considered. Um, you know, study groups made up entirely of males or groups with too many dominant animals can cause aggressive or, or self-injurious behaviors, especially in macaque species. And while we, are, while we are evaluating and selecting these animals, we should also be developing enrichment plans at the same time to take into account the more limited opportunities that animals in these spaces, spaces may have to be socially housed or to interact with conspecifics. Veterinarians and researchers can collaborate with behavior personnel to train animals for voluntary participation prior to study starting. So in this picture, a rhesus is participating in a voluntary blood draw. And while this particular procedure would probably not be feasible in high containment during safety, you know, due to safety concerns, uh, the theory behind it can still be applied. If a study involves daily oral administration of a therapeutic, the animals could be trained prior to study start to start voluntarily taking the therapeutic, which would then eliminate the need to sedate the animals every day for gastric intubation. So as we consider which animals should go into high containment or barrier facilities, we also need to consider characteristics of caging systems to maximize animal welfare and human safety, such as the applicable laws and regulations in the Animal Welfare Act, the guide, and PHS policy. Caging should be large enough to provide required floor space, but small enough to allow, in the case of rodents, the primary housing enclosure to fit into the biosafety cabinet and have laminar flow maintained. Ventilated caging systems often have solid sides that block light, resulting in a dark cage interior, which can make it difficult to observe the animals, especially if you are trying to perform those observations remotely through a camera. If the cage door must be opened to complete observations, it disturbs the animals within, and it also impacts the cage's, the cage's negative ventilation barrier. The presence of a squeeze-back mechanism in deep caging will facilitate removal of animals from their housing. And then if you have IVCs, those should have battery backups and audible visual alarms to alert when a cage rack is on a battery backup. Enrichment devices in these spaces should be disposable, autoclavable, and or able to withstand surface decontamination. So disposable enrichment products are usually made of paper or cardboard, like cardboard huts, as you can see here, tubes, or bedding with paper pieces are often used with rodents. And then after use, those items can be you know, decontaminated and then just disposed of. For reusable enrichment items, it's ideal if they can be decontaminated first and then processed through cage wash machines prior to being reused. Enrichment devices that are traditionally provided to non-human primates 
hold up well to sanitization in a cage washer, but they're not always autoclavable. So autoclavable devices such as puzzle feeders made of polycarbonate or polysulfone or metal devices are available um, and they can usually be reused if they are sterilized. And then of course, food treats are also a viable enrichment option for some species depending on your study design. All right, finally, some additional resources for future reference. The Biosafety Level 4 Zoonotic Laboratory Network was established in 2016 as a network of government mandated organizations with national level responsibility for protecting animal and human health by working together to enhance knowledge, competency, and capacity to meet current and future high containment needs. The steering committees and working groups have published several articles that may be of interest to you. And one of the major strategic focus areas of the network is strengthening laboratory personnel training, which thus far has been accomplished through several training workshops. The National Center for the Replacement, Refinement, and Reduction of Animals in Research was established in 2004. And you can see their mission here. Their website has a wealth of information on grimace scales, experimental design and reporting, husbandry, and new research methodologies. There are some absolutely fantastic papers out that talk about a lot of the things um, that we discussed today. I also want to encourage everyone to check out the Animal Welfare Information Center, um, they have some great resources for environmental enrichment, especially for non-human primates. Most of the articles on, on this slide are great and have to do with grimace scales. I want to again point out the Clagis article, Iacook and Veterinary Considerations for Review of ABSL3 and ABSL4 Research Protocols. I always have to cite the bimbo. Um, and then if your institution has non-human primates, I would encourage you to check out the National Primate Research Center Behavior Management Consortium. They have some truly excellent trainings and other resources for animal welfare assessments and enrichment for non-human primates. Um, if you're interested in telemetry but don't know too much about it, there's this great overview of telemetry for small animals in lab animal medicine. And with that, um, what questions do you have for me? Hi, Dr. Tansy. Um, we don't have any questions at this particular time. Oh, one just <laughs> came through. Okay. Um, do you have any tips for IACUX conducting remote, so live video inspections? and any areas of uh, special emphasis for close-up viewing or any request to make of the videographer? Oh, any request to make of a videographer. Okay, uh, so some of this is just going to depend on, on how your facility is, is laid out. Um, I, think, I think having a checklist and having all of your IACUC members contribute to that and really review ahead of time what you think are the most important welfare indicators is, is really important. Um, if there are, you know, a, a lot of the times in high containment facilities, you can try to schedule those inspections while the suite is down. So there are no infectious agents present and the suite has been decontaminated. So then you can actually safely walk into those spaces. Obviously the trade-off with that is that animals are not present. So you are really looking at the space and the materials and everything else and potentially doing a record review. But sometimes that is, um, that's, that's the happy medium between safety and still being able to go into those suites. I would always pay, so I personally always pay attention when I'm in these suites or, or doing um, video, video assessments. I like to look at the anesthetic, like the anesthetic, 
anesthetic agents that are being utilized, pay close attention to calibration and any expiration dates. Um, look at if there are, you know, if there are sterile or clean, clean equipment that's being used, look at the dates that those were autoclaved to make sure that everything is still in date. Um, I usually pay pretty close attention to any feed bins to make sure that the food is in date and to see the date that those bins were last, um, last sanitized. Um, so those would be some of my helpful hints. We have another, a few questions. Um, any ideas on how these areas can also be part of PAM? Yes, so post-approval monitoring, I do. And again, this is with the caveat that pretty much everything that I say has to do with your specific facility and how it is laid out. Um, there are some cases, if you, have if you have remote video capabilities in your facility, that is great. Um, our facility has some overhead cameras that are built into the suite. And so our post-approval monitoring monitor will go in and actually be sitting there and in front of the monitor and watching the activities through that camera live while we are performing activities in there. There are also a lot of suites that have windows to an outer corridor that is still restricted to, you know, two personnel. So you don't just have random people walking around, but you can stop in that window and you can actually look into the animal housing room or the animal procedure room. So our, again, our post-approval monitor will um, coordinate with our PIs to find out what days they'll be doing animal work. And then sometimes he will go and, and stand at, at the window and you know monitor and kind of watch what they're doing. If he has specific questions, he can kind of ask them to bring cages of animals to the window for him to evaluate so that so that he can see that. Um, we also occasionally do that with veterinary assessment. So if I have a researcher that's inside and they want, you know, they want an assessment of an animal from, you know, a blinded observer, then sometimes our veterinary staff will go to the window and the researcher will bring the cage to the window so that the vet can assess and, and see if further, um, if anything else, further treatment or anything else is required. So that, that's actually interesting because there's a comment in the chat um, that's talking about the video monitoring and concerns about security. So it yeah. says the um, concerns about security if you're using video monitoring of animals in these spaces, getting IT involved if you aren't sure, if you aren't potentially having um, a hacker getting into your video feed. Our institution has a lot of internet security firewalls yeah. um, that must be followed. So, And the other thing that you can also consider with videos is having it hardwired into your facility so that the output only goes to one single computer. That, and that computer is then not connected to the internet. So, so that is one of the things that we do here for the, for the same security concern. But absolutely, if you guys are looking at remote monitoring and, and things like that, you, that would fall under the you know, special security concerns under the IACUC protocol review and make sure that you are looping in your, your IT support so they can provide appropriate guidance. But this, this remote monitoring is a really good way to have all of your IFF members being able to participate in the inspections, not just you know, people who have a specialized experience. Um, all right, we have a lot coming in now. Somebody <laughs> says, <laughs> we went with the hardware option for our high containment facility just for that reason. So great point. Um, we have one other question right now. Is ABSL4 sweet decontamination agent of, of choice still a paraformaldehyde? Oh, you that's know. a great question. Um, we do not, so we do not use paraformaldehyde. Um, it is absolutely still, it is absolutely still a viable option, 100%. Um, and there are institutions around the country that do still use that. But there are other there are other choices. Um, some of that is going to depend on site specific risk assessments of what agents you are working with and what what what's yeah. I mean, it's really very site specific risk assessments. Um, but if you would like to have that discussion, whoever asked that question, you are welcome to email me, and and I am happy to give you more details. 
All right, we'll put your email in the chat just one more time. At cc.gov. All right, so we are almost at two o'clock. I think we have gotten to everybody's questions. Um, and so we did have some questions during the webinar about whether the slides and the webinar recording is going to be posted. So they are going to be posted. We do need to process them for 508 compliance, um, which is taking about a few weeks right now. So we'll get that up as soon as we can. In the meantime, here's a shameless plug to please go and visit our website. Um, we have all of our webinars up there and you can monitor when we post um, these slides and the transcript and the recording on there. We'll also send out a news flash so that everybody's in the know. And with that, I think we are all set for today. So I would like to give you a huge thanks, Dr. Tansri, for coming and presenting with us today and being such a good sport. Um, thank you also to all of our participants for coming and joining us today. Um, our next webinar topic is to be determined. It will be this fall, 2022. So that's all we have for you today. Thank you so much and goodbye. Thanks, everyone.